On today's show, what Evan Mobley did against the Raptors on Wednesday night was very impressive, but more importantly, it's very repeatable. We'll talk about why on this edition of Locked on Cavs. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? My name is Danny Cunningham. You can, you might know me from my time covering the Cleveland Cavaliers, places like my new Substack, The Inside Shot, 92.3 The Fan, Cleveland Magazine, a number of other stops I've been at along the way. I want to say thank you to you for making Locked On Cavs your first listen today and every day. You can find the show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else. Drop us a five-star rating. Leave us a nice review as well. Be a friend. Tell a friend about Locked on Cavs. Cavs season is here. I think you've got some pretty good Cavs content. I want everyone you know that is a Cavs fan to have a pretty good to have some pretty good Cavs content as well. Also, check us out on YouTube. Just search Locked on Cavs on YouTube. If you're watching this video right now, hit that thumbs up button for me. Click subscribe and Hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on the latest Locked On Cavs content. A proud part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode, of course, is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets. Guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com today to get started. Cavs got a 30-point win on opening night. Everyone's very impressed with how the team looked. Everyone, more importantly, is very impressed with how Evan Mobley looked, right? That was the biggest story that came out out of opening night. Really, that'll be the biggest thing that happens all week for the Cavs. That is the most important thing that can happen this year, is Evan Mobley looking the way he looked on Wednesday night in Toronto, right? The aggressiveness that he had, the sense of urgency that he had. There's nobody that thinks anything other than that was a really impressive performance. There are some caveats in there. Oh, you know, it's the Raptors. They're not going to be all that great. Or it's only one night. It needs to be done consistently. And I get those things. I totally understand those things. But after looking at this, what he was able to do, this performance, a little bit deeper, it's hard not to be impressed with Evan Mobley. But I also am at the point now, I think what Evan did on Wednesday night is something that's very repeatable for him. I don't expect this type of performance to just be a flash in the pan type of night. I expect Evan Mobley, while he's not going to be that guy every night, because in the NBA, it's an 82-game season. Nobody is at their best every single night. But I expect there are going to be more of the nights that we saw from Evan Mobley on Wednesday night than the off nights that he's going to have. And he will have them. He will. He's going to have nights that where he looks like a pedestrian offensive player. But he's going to have a lot more nights, I think, where he looks like he did on Wednesday night, where he was aggressive, where he played with a real sense of urgency. I thought he he displayed things. He displayed some things that I just don't think that we've seen before. And I do think some of them, and I think that this is a really important part of why I believe in Evan Mobley. Some of it is because he very clearly has added weight. He's added strength. Like he is physically... Just by looking at Evan, you can tell, okay, Evan Mobley is a different basketball player than he was last year. Just by looking at him, you can tell that. And then what I think that has done for him, what I think that physical change in Evan Mobley, adding the weight, adding the strength, I think that has added to his attitude shift. Because defensively, throughout Evan's career, I think he's been a monster. I think he's been aggressive. I think he's been, I I don't want to say mean, right? Because Evan is a nice guy, maybe to a fault, it seems like. But he's had, he's had that edge, I guess is the best way to say it, on the defensive end of the court. But when he's got onto the other side of the court, I don't think that edge has always followed him. But now that I think he's a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger, I think that that aggressiveness we've seen, I think the sense of urgency he's played with, And I think we saw a little bit of an edge from him on Wednesday night. I think that those are things that are a result of what he was able to do this offseason in terms of the type of work that he put in. And one of the things that I thought really where it really showed was Evan took two three pointers. That's it. It wasn't some, you know, he didn't score 25 points because he hit four threes. He took two three-pointers 
he connected on one of them. If I'm not mistaken, I think they came pretty close together, like within five possessions when both of his three-pointers came. The first one was at the top of the arc. He missed it just a little bit too much on it. The shot looked fine. Um, you know, the Raptors did contest it. But the second one was on the wing, or not on the wing, in the right corner. It came off of a pass from Karis LeVert, and Evan Mobley wasn't defended. And in the past, I think in these spots where teams are very clearly going to say, you know what, Evan, go ahead, take that shot. We don't mind you shooting that. And I think we've seen this with Isaac Okoro at some time, at some points too. But teams are going to say, we don't mind you taking that shot. Like if you, Evan Mobley, are going to make that shot, we'll live with it. We're not going to defend you. We're not going to close out on you as hard as we probably should because we don't trust you're going to be able to hurt us. And previously, I think that can be something that maybe messes with the psyche of some players where it'd be, oh, they're not going to guard me. Should I actually be shooting this? Right? Where it's a, you start to, you start to see guys second guess themselves almost where they go from a confident shooter. They're almost more confident shooting the basketball when they're being defended to they might become a little cautious. Then they might become a little, you know, a little hesitant to take that shot if they're not being defended because it might in their mind register as something's wrong here. Well, when Evan was put in that spot on Wednesday night, to me, the way he looked, and this is just looking through a screen, it almost looked as if he felt like he was being disrespected the way that he took that jump shot. He made the three. To me, it looked like, okay, this is this is the Raptors disrespecting Evan Mobley. And that's how I thought he took it. And then after that, you saw him just continue to take over the game. Like you saw that edge. And I don't know that that exact thing, that that mindset was present in Evan Mobley enough. We've seen it in flashes. And maybe I'll be wrong about this, and Wednesday night will just be a flash in the pan. I really don't think that it is. But I thought with what we saw from him, I think that is a prime example of that new attitude that he has, that new edge that he seems to be playing with offensively that didn't always exist for him. I think that is something that can come out every single night. I see no reason why it can't come out every single night. And then, you know, there were a couple of other things that he did just from a physical standpoint on Wednesday night that I was really impressed with. Like he had the one play where he grabbed the ball off of a miss, took it down the floor and hit a basically like a, a five foot floater um, after a Euro step. I don't think Evan Mobley was really doing that. Not necessarily, and certainly not as fluid and as smooth as he was able to do it on Wednesday night against the Raptors. Is he going to have that type of move in his bag every night? I don't know. But I know that he's capable of it now because I've seen it. And then the the one other thing on offense that stood out to me, this was in the second half. He hit a turnaround jumper over Scotty Barnes, and he's hit this type of shot before. But he starts with the ball out on the wing. He gets down to the, the block, does a little bit of a reverse spin back towards the middle of the floor. And then that was the moment where I'm like, okay, Evan Mobley's touch around the rim on those short shots looks better than it has in the past. I think that is something that has taken a step forward. I thought you saw it on the Euro step. I thought you saw it on the turnaround jumper. I, I thought you saw it a couple of times. And I just don't know. I don't know if that was a thing that Evan Mobley previously had. And those are the things offensively that do excite me. And then defensively, I thought he was awesome. Like Scotty Barnes, just Wednesday night, did not have a good time against him. Um, according to NBA.com, when Evan Mobley was the primary defender, Members of the Raptors went five for 21 shooting when he was defending them. Now, that number might not be exact. NBA.com's data is not necessarily always the best. Like when, when teams are going to pool data about how defenders play, they're not using this set of data. They have There are other companies that do this that I don't have access to as of right now. But that's what I have to go off of. And that's how it felt. Like Scotty Barnes was three of 14 on Wednesday. A lot of that came with Evan Mobley defending him. It just looked like he did not have fun. Like it looked like he had a very, very difficult time trying to operate on the offensive end of the floor with Evan Mobley defending him. And that's not a new thing. That's who Evan Mobley's been. 
I have no reason to believe that is that's going to change. But that leads me to this. All of this, all of what we saw on Wednesday is very repeatable. Like if Evan would have put up the same stat line, but let's just say he had five three-pointers, I think everyone would be excited. And everyone would feel as if, oh, you know, he can space the floor now. But that three-point shooting for him, who's not an established good outside shooter, I do think he'll have nights where it looks pretty good. But I also think it's going to be something that could be pretty volatile, where he might have nights where he does hit four or five threes, but he might have a three-game stretch where he misses every three-pointer he takes. But I don't think that there's going to be a three a three or four-game stretch where we don't see the aggressiveness that we've seen from him in the preseason and on Wednesday night. So that's why I think what we saw from Evan Mobley in game number one, it's not going to be repeated 81 more times. It's not. That's not how the NBA works. But can that be the standard for Evan Mobley now? I don't see any reason why it can't be. I think that what we saw Wednesday night from Evan Mobley, that should just be who Evan Mobley is now. We're going to find out soon if he can consistently do that, but I don't see a reason why he can't. The Cavs won by 30 against Toronto. A lot of stuff was really good, but I'm going to get a little nitpicky and talk about some things I saw in game one that could be improved upon. We'll talk about that next right here on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action with over 10 million members and billions of dollars in awarded winnings. Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Run your game all season long with Prize Picks. Like I said, you can now win 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. Prize Picks is the best way to get action on sports in over 30 states, including California, Florida, Georgia, Texas. And Prize Picks is the only real money daily fantasy platform with an injury insurance policy. So your lineups stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. If your player leaves in the first half, doesn't return, Prize Picks keeps your lineup live. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action. Join over 10 million users and sign up today. If you want to play Prize Picks alongside people like Drewski, Joe Budden, MMA champ, champ Sean O'Malley. You can now find community plays under the promo tab at the top of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize pick community each week. So what I need you to do, download the app today, use code LOCKEDONNBA to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Again, download the app today, use code LOCKEDONNBA, that's L O C K. E D O N N B A and get $50 off or get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Again, download the app, use code locked on NBA, $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks run your game. Thank you again for making Locked on Cavs your first listen today and every day. I also want to say thank you to you guys for sticking with me. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've been sick. I don't know if you've been able to tell it my voice. I'm sure if you are watching on YouTube, you've been able to tell. Like, I will take these pauses where I've kind of, like, been trying to put off having to cough. Um, the recording process has not been the most fun. Like, some of the videos on YouTube, you can't necessarily tell this so much if you listen via, you know, Apple or Spotify or any other podcasting platform that you should be subscribed on. But if you're watching on YouTube, like you can see me have to take a little bit of a deeper breath at some points um, and try and muffle a cough. And that has not been the most fun or the editing process where it seems like some sentences get cut in the middle. It's due, it is because I've had coughing fits. Um, so I want to say thank you to you guys for sticking with me because um, listening to a sick podcaster, not always the most pleasant experience, but I am doing my best. Um, I, I think I'm on the other side of this. Hopefully when I get back later this weekend, I will totally be past this. That's the hope. Um, again, also, if you're watching on YouTube right now, hit that thumbs up button for me. Click subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you don't miss the latest Locked on Cavs content as soon as it's coming your way. Um, so Wednesday night, there was a lot to like from that Cavs win over the Raptors. Obviously, I mean, they won 136 to 106. 
So anything I say negative about that game, it has to be taken with a grain of salt, right? Because they looked awesome but they weren't perfect. And I also think that it's worth talking about the things that can improve even after a huge win like that, where everyone's pumped up and excited and should be because it was an awesome win by the Cavs. But I also think that it's a reminder that what they look like on, what was that, October 23rd, that's not the finished product of who they're going to be. Like the Cavs looked really, really good on Wednesday night. That's not going to be the best game they play all year. The Cavs are going to get better with time. And there are some things that didn't necessarily go as well as they could have for the Cavs on opening night. And again, it's not to say they didn't play awesome because they did. But there were a couple of things that I think are worth pointing out and just saying, hey, this can get better. Like if you're looking for more upside with the Cavs, because you know, I've spent a ton of time talking about how good Evan Mobley was. I probably haven't talked about how good Donovan Mitchell was enough, but Donovan Mitchell was, I thought, really terrific against the Raptors, not having to carry a very heavy load because of Evan Mobley. You know, Karis Levert was awesome. I don't expect Karis Levert to go eight of nine on a nightly basis, but he was awesome. And I've talked about that stuff. But I think there are areas where they can improve in area number one. I absolutely think is Darius Garland. Um, I thought that the shot selection he had, he was three of 12 against the Raptors. I thought his shot selection was fine. I didn't think it was great. I didn't think it was poor. Um, He took the one really long two that I didn't necessarily love. He took, you know, what I thought were some good looks from beyond the arc. I think he was one of six. Um, I also wonder how much did the, the foul trouble that he dealt with where he picked up four fouls in the first half and just didn't play his, his normal minutes allotment, I wonder how much that attributed to him having an off night. I thought that him having a really good night would have been a great sign for the Cavs, just considering everything he went he went through last year, getting off to a good start for him, I thought would have been a really big deal. I thought that would have been a real positive. It's not as if I'm worried now that Darius Garland's not going to have a bounce back year because he didn't have a bounce back season opener, but it would have been something that was nice to see. And that is another area where the Cavs can absolutely get better because they should be getting more production from Darius Garland than they got on Wednesday night. I will say as the the plus to Darius Garland having an, an off night, having a night that was hampered by foul trouble, I thought Ty Jerome looked pretty good filling in for him. I Jerome was the ninth guy or 10th guy to play for the Cavs. He was the 10th guy to play for the Cavs. I think he would have played if Garland didn't get in foul trouble but I definitely don't think he would have played as much as he did if Garland didn't get into foul trouble, but I thought that he filled in pretty admirably. I liked what I saw from Ty Jerome. Um, One of the other things that I absolutely think will be approved upon, a lot of the conversation this training camp was about the Cavs, one, playing with more pace, and two, shooting more three-pointers, where you know they took a ton of three-pointers in that first preseason game against Chicago. They played lightning fast. Um, probably a, an unsustainable pace. But against the Raptors on Wednesday night, the Caps only took 33 pointers. I would be surprised. I would be very surprised if that volume of three pointer, three point attempts is not one of their 10 lowest games of the year. I do think that this team is going to make it a priority to get those shots up. I was surprised they were only at 30. Now, part of it might just be opening night. Part of it just might be the Raptors were thin inside, and that was an area where they could attack the basket. They could get going in transition. They could do a lot of the things that they did well because they were really good inside the paint. So the three-pointers weren't as important. That could absolutely be it. But I would be surprised if there's more than like 10 other games this year where the Cavs are below 35 three-point attempts. I just don't think that's the style of basketball they're going to end up playing. I did think it was a good sign, as long as I'm talking about the three-pointers here. I did think it was a good sign that nine players, I think everyone that attempted a three-pointer, nine guys attempted a three-pointer, nine guys made a three-pointer. Everyone that attempted at least one three-pointer made at least one three-pointer. A few guys hit multiple ones. Obviously, Donovan Mitchell did, Ty Jerome did. But it was good to see Evan Mobley hit one. It was good to even see Jalen Tyson in uh, cleanup time at the end of the game 
hit a three-pointer. It was good to see everybody that took a three-pointer was able to connect on a three-pointer. Karis LeVert, um, Darius Garland one of, did hit one of his six. So I thought that was a good sign. But, and, and listen, anytime you shoot nearly 50% from beyond the arc, you're going to be happy with that. Cavs are 14 of 30. They should be happy with that. But I think that's an area where the Cavs will want to take a higher volume of threes than what they did on Wednesday night. And I just think that's one of the things that when you look at this game and say, okay, the Cavs played awesome, but it wasn't perfect. What areas can they improve upon? What areas can they be better at? I think generating more three-point looks is an area where the Cavs are going to want to be better and the Cavs can improve. Like those looks will be there. And maybe this was a, a game plan specific thing. I don't know. But I do think that this is going to be when we are, you know, when I do a show after the final regular season game and I look at all 82 box scores, I'm going to bet that 33 point attempts, which is what the Cavs had on Wednesday night, is among the 10 fewest uh, games they have in terms of attempts from beyond the arc. I think that's a number that'll get boosted. I think that's an area where they can improve. And I think Darius Garland's going to be better. I do. I don't think there's going to be very many nights where he has four fouls in the first half and has to spend a large chunk of the second quarter on the bench. I did like, though, that Kenny Atkinson gave him the opportunity to play through it. Like, Kenny could have pulled him after he picked up two fouls, and he let him play through it. Obviously, Darius picked up his third one, and Kenny really couldn't let him play through that. And then when you pick up your fourth foul in the first half, I mean, you kind of you can't you can't really let a guy play through that. That just gets a little bit too dangerous. So those are the things that I do think, you know, the Cavs have areas to improve. They 100% do. They're not a finished product. They look really good, but they're not a finished product. Those are er- those areas, Darius Garland, more three point attempts. Those are the things that I look at and say, OK, that was an awesome game but where can they get better? And those are the two areas I look at. Cavs do have two games. The first back-to-back of the season, Detroit, Washington, Detroit at home, Washington on the road, Friday and Saturday. What do we have to look forward to in these Cavs games? We'll talk about them next right here on Locked on Cavs. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel, and I've told you about FanDuel a ton because FanDuel is America's number one sports book. And right now you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel because you can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. I've been telling you guys, Cavs win total was set at 48 and a half. I love the over. I feel really good about the over after watching them play uh, one single game. If I could double down on that, I would. But FanDuel has so much more now that the season has begun. One of the things that you can do is you can bet on the games while they're happening with live betting on FanDuel. But what makes the live betting experience on FanDuel even better is when you're watching the game, you can check out the latest stats, the live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you're placing your bets. What page is that? It's the page on the FanDuel Sportsbook. That's the place that you're going to want to go to make your bets because it is America's number one sportsbook. And like I said, new customers can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. All you got to do, maybe you like the Cavaliers Friday night at home against Detroit. Maybe that's where your heart is. Toss five bucks on them, whether it's on the money line, on the spread, whatever your heart desires. You can do that. Get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's not a bad way. I mean, that's not a bad way to spend a Friday night. Cavs minus 10 and a half, five bucks on it, and then get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. I mean, it's things like that that make FanDuel America's number one sports book. So head on over to FanDuel.com today and get set up. That's F-A-N-D-U-E-L.com today. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Thank you again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen today and every day. You can find the show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else. Check us out on YouTube too. Just search Locked On Cavs. If you're watching this video right now, hit that thumbs up button for me. Click subscribe, hit the notification bell. Be a friend, tell a friend about the Locked On Cavs podcast. Also, we do have newsletters now. The Locked On Cavs newsletter is your daily place to go to get the latest with the Cavs around the league. I put a a short story in there every single day. Um, Sign up 
link in the bio, but it is the place to go if you want to get the ultimate Cleveland Cavaliers newsletter. The Locked On Cavs newsletter is the place to do it. Just sign up with a link in this episode description, either on your podcast platform you're listening to this to or wherever you are watching on YouTube. So the Cavs play tonight, Friday, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, against the Detroit Pistons. Uh, old friend J.B. Bickerstaff in town to open up Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse's 30th season um, very exciting stuff. Obviously, the home opener always going to be fun. Detroit comes in this game. They lost their first game against the Indiana Pacers. Detroit actually looked pretty good for most of that game. They fumbled away. I believe it was an eight-point lead in the fourth quarter against the Pacers. But the Pistons, listen, I think a lot of you guys know this from watching the Cavs under J.B. Bickerstaff the last several years. Detroit's going to play hard. Any team that J.B. Bickerstaff is the head coach of, that team is going to play hard. And I would anticipate, because of the history with J.B. Bickerstaff and the Cavs, the Pistons are going to play extra hard on Friday night. I don't think that this is going to be a game. And listen, if it is a game where it's a blowout, that means the Cavs had to play really, really well. Detroit is not going to win a ton of games this year. But they're also not going to be a team like they were last year, where they won 14 games and were just an eyesore to the NBA. They're not going to be the laughing stock of the league anymore. They're going to be respectable. This is a game the Cavs should win. As I mentioned, the Cavs are favored by 10 and a half over Detroit at home. It's a game they should win, but it's also not going to be just some walk in the park. I think opening night, um, the home opener, obviously a very exciting time, expecting it to be a great crowd. Crowds at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse typically are. I think the home opener will be a very good crowd. Um, so that it, it'll be a fun time for everybody. And then, you know, this is the first back to back of the year for the Cavs. It's interesting that they open up the season with three games in four nights. They travel after the game Friday night against Detroit. They will head to Washington, D.C. Take on the Wizards in game number three. The Wizards opened up their season on Thursday night as they lost to the Boston Celtics, which I think everybody sort of expected. Like no one expected Washington to go out and beat the Celtics in, in that game on on uh, on Thursday night, certainly they lost 122 to 102. I believe Bob Carrington left the game with an injury. Jordan Poole, obviously the guy to watch watch for on Washington. He had like 17 points in the first quarter and then finished the game with 26 points. So he didn't have a great final three quarters, but he's going to have to be the guy that the Cavs are going to have to contain. But Cleveland has an awesome opportunity after how good they looked on Wednesday night. They have an awesome opportunity to get to 3-0 and this weekend before they take on the New York Knicks at Madison Square Garden, which is going to be a game a lot of people have their eyes on on Monday night. Next week for the Cavs is going to be a very big week. They've got New York. They've got the Los Angeles Lakers. They have the Orlando Magic, and they've got the Milwaukee Bucks. It's going to be a big week. There are going to be a lot of eyes on the Cavs. We're going to know a lot more about this team one week from right now than we do today. I'm super excited about it. I'm super excited to see how Evan Mobley looks through all of this, and I hope that you guys are too. So once again, thank you so much for making Locked On Cavs your first listen today and every day. You can find the show anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, anywhere else. Drop us a five-star rating. Leave us a nice review. Be a friend. Tell a friend about the Locked On Cavs podcast. Also, check us out on YouTube. Just search Locked On Cavs on YouTube. If you're watching this, hit that thumbs up button, click subscribe, and hit the notification bell. 